U.S. and Chinese officials are expected to meet next month for another round of trade talks. According to new data, China, China's economic slowdown is getting worse, which could serve as an incentive to repair its relationship with the United States. Meanwhile, U.S. stocks appear to be holding up despite a spike in crude oil prices following the drone attacks on two of Saudi Arabia's oil facilities. Here via Skype to dig into all things impacting the U.S. economy right now is professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts, Richard Wolff. He is also the co-founder of Democracy at Work. Welcome back, sir. Glad to be here. I was hoping you could start by talking big picture about the rise of China and what it means for the U.S. and for American workers in particular. Yeah, I think uh, it's becoming the dominant story, certainly of these days and months and years, and perhaps for many of us, for decades. China is an ascending power, economically, politically, culturally, literally in every way. Uh, it has been, for the last 25 years, the fastest growing economy, basically, in the world. It's an extraordinary record. Uh, through most of that time, China has grown two to three times faster in terms of its GDP per year than the United States, which is why it is catching up uh, in the way that it is. And it is a problem for the United States, which has not faced anything like that kind of uh, exploding competition, if you like, uh, for at least the last century. And I think, therefore, uh, we're in for a bumpy ride. Mm -hmm. I think what's going on with the trade war is a struggle mostly inside the United States, not so much in China, about what to do in the face of this rapidly ascending power. On the extreme right wing, there are people who actually believe they can stop it, slow it, maybe have regime change, turn it around, and remove this competitive threat. That is dangerous thinking, and it is, in my judgment, total fantasy. Then there's a second group that wants to punish China in some way for various things it has done that explain why it's growing so quickly, and they're willing to make some sort of deal here, um, but they're going to do it, or they think they're going to do it, at the expense of the very successes, particularly economic, that China has had. And finally, uh, there is what I still believe to be the bulk of the American business community that doesn't want any of this, that has invested hundreds of billions of dollars inside China, uh, that depends on the trade with China, that invested in China precisely to make profit by bringing that stuff back to the United States, because it can be more cheaply produced in China, et cetera. They want a normalization. They want this trade war to go away. Right. And I think you're going to see a struggle that's already underway among these three groups in the United States, duking it out over what to do. Mm -hmm. right. Professor, don't you think, though, that the business, the fact that the business community is so united in wanting to produce cheap product in order to sell to American consumers should worry American workers and manufacturers in particular because it shows that the business community and our de facto trade and economic policy does not value domestic production, it values domestic consumption. Is that the right way that we should think about our economy and our politics? No, it's probably not the right way, but it is surely the way that uh, capitalist business has always worked. If you look at American history, production used to happen in the Northeast and Midwest at relatively high wages. Then they left and went to the South, the Southeast, the Southwest, and so forth. When that wasn't cheap enough, they went to Mexico. Now they have gone further to China. Uh, this is a long, similar story, and it would be hard to imagine a capitalist system of the sort we've had in the United States uh, that prevented or stopped uh, corporations from doing that very quintessentially profit-driven kind of a adjustment. Mm -hmm. Right. It's always been essentially a race to the bottom under the current system. Yeah. Uh, Professor, I also wanted to ask you about uh, the new GM strike. Tens of thousands of workers at General Motors going on strike in one of the largest uprisings that we've seen in, in quite a while. What do you make of this uh, development? What does it say about the labor movement in America? 
I think it's shifting. I think for the first time, and I'm I'm not the kind of person who uh, thinks this quickly, but I can see in a whole host of events, starting with those remarkable strikes of public school teachers last year in West Virginia and Oklahoma and Arizona and so on, I'm seeing a shift in the labor movement in which the working people of America uh, using their unions are demanding a share of what has been the growing wealth. They're angry about the inequality and they're now putting their bodies and their commitments on show for Americans that the labor movement is coming back. You know, we were surprised when Bernie Sanders uh, didn't get rid of that label socialist back in 2016. And now we see even more uh, people using that title. Socialism is coming back. I think the same underlying movement is activating the labor uh, forces in this country. And that is also going to shape the years ahead. Mm -hmm. What do you think that has precipitated the rise in this labor activity? Is it just what, what broke, I guess, in the American business community that has made it so that these workers are beginning to rise up through unions? I think they are observing, first and foremost, a level of inequality that literally you have to go back a century uh, in the days of the robber barons at the end of the 19th century to see uh, neither Republicans nor Democrats have seemed able to prevent that from continuing. Uh, the hopes of the labor movement coming out of the Great Depression, that the, the good times, if you like, of the 40s, 50s, and 60s would continue has now been definitively smashed. I think the election of Donald Trump was a beginning of a demand by working people for not having business as usual. In that case, the people went to the right. That's not solving the problem either. We're already three and a half years into it. And I think there's going to be a growing feeling among working people that the right wing approach didn't do it. Let's try the other one. And they're remembering and recouping the other part of American history, which is a history of labor activism and social activism as well. Right. And there's some polling that indicates unions have, you know, essentially never been more popular, at least in my lifetime, which is also, you know, ties into what you're saying. I was on the ground quite a bit during the teachers movement in West Virginia, as well as in Kentucky, where I used to live. And what really struck me is that these were not sort of militant political activists, right? These were regular, many of them non-political, many of them Trump voting teachers who just took some of the most militant and aggressive actions that we've seen in quite a long time. Um, that was what really struck me, was that these were not typical quote unquote activists. These were just regular middle and working class people who decided they'd had enough. Not only, absolutely, but let me take it one step further. The most remarkable thing in the case of West Virginia was that those teachers, without that militant background, without that militant history, were able to organize committees to pull that strike off in every single county of the state of West Virginia. It was the best organized, most comprehensive strike action ever seen in that state, even including its history of mining and so on. So I think you're seeing exactly what you say. And a last point, yes, some of them were Trump supporters. And let's no one miss this point. Those Trump supporters had hoped that Trump would help them. He didn't. What they saw was Bernie Sanders and folks like that making big statements and visiting West Virginia. That lesson is not being lost and is part of a realignment that is going to show up and surprise people in the form not only of the strike of General Motors, but there has been a strike vote taken overwhelmingly at the Kaiser Permanente workforce in California, which, mm -hmm. if they go on strike in October, will be the largest strike since 1997 in the United States. Yeah. And that, too, will be a milestone. Right. Yeah. And hairline caterers have also threatened a strike. So a lot to keep an eye on. Absolutely. Um, Professor, thank you so much. It's great to have thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. My pleasure. Glad to talk with you. Absolutely. We'll have more rising for you after this.